Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the CGHE seminar, uh, webinar series on African research and the global science uh, system. Um, and this is webinar number two of the series, starting from uh, last week. Um, I am Adam Sagada Beber, or Adam, a DPhil or PhD student at the Department of Education here at Oxford. And today we will be hearing from Dr. Beber Zagaye on the political economy of knowledge production in Ethiopian higher education. In this presentation, he will draw on his experience of working within and data from two Ethiopian universities and generally Ethiopian education overall, and as well as the Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Um, Dr. Babazagaye holds a DPhil from the University of Oxford and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics, Philosophy and Sociology from Haverford College. He has previously taught at Yale University, University of California, Santa Barbara, University of South, South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. And since 2014, he has been based in Ethiopia as Vice President of Wallo University, Director of Global Engagement and Institutional Transformation at Wallgate University, and Director of Higher Education at the Ministry of Science and Higher Education, Government of Ethiopia. Before I hand over to Dr. Abeba, there are some brief housekeeping points to mention. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CGE website tomorrow morning. A transcript of the chat function conversation will be posted. And please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question. We recommend using a speaker view so you can more, so you can more clearly see who's talking. To ask a question, use the chat function and write out the questions you wish to ask. And at the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, I will be asking you or inviting you to ask to speak directly. And when invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. I will now pass over to Dr. Abbeba for the CG seminar. And thank you, Dr. Abbeba, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you for asking me to give this talk. It's a rather short. But I've decided not to put any kind of data or any kind of information. Therefore, it will be mainly I'll be discussing it. But at some moment, some of the things can be posted and I'll make them available. Uh, education in Ethiopia has been important since Second, Second World War. Haile Selassie's regime, right after he came back from exile, Education was his priority. Derg is the same thing from 1974 and EPRD from 1991 on. Uh, I'll be concentrating on post-1991, uh, but with reference to the previous years. Uh, I think from the beginning, I would like to stress that there's been this complete acceptance of Western education and Western technology from the beginning, the beginning, I mean, after the war, or when even Menelik introduced that. And there is a very little work done in terms of incorporating Ethiopia's long knowledge production. I'll come back to that at some moment. In other words, indigenous knowledge has been neglected throughout all this period uh, for all kinds of reasons, I'll come back. But what I will talk about today would be post-1991. And the main aim was to have, of, of, of the regime, I mean, the EPRDF regime was to have huge amount of access to a large population, some kind of quality of education, some kind of, uh, equity and relevant to the economy. Uh, though there is a huge expansion, and let me give you some idea of the expansion which happened over the last 27 years in Ethiopia. Primary education, for instance, has been expanded to the point where now almost in every rural area of Ethiopia, children have access to primary education. Same thing with, 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 with secondary education. There has been huge amount of expansion 
and that's been somewhat achieved. Uh, then there is what is called TVET, uh, Technical Vocational Education and Training. That has increased over the last 30 years by sixfold, something like between 250,000 to 300,000 students were involved. This is the data of 2016. Higher education, uh, when EPRDF came to power, in real terms, there were only two universities, Halamaya and Addis Ababa. Since then, we have, just even if we look up to 2016, there are 38 accredited government universities in Ethiopia. So when we look at the numbers, the undergraduates has expanded, let's say from 2003, four, which is 56,000 students, to when you look at 2016 data, to 778,000, almost 800,000 students. Graduate, uh, graduate school also has expanded from mere 2,500 to something like 51,521. So there is this huge expansion. It, it succeeded in one sense that it has made it accessible for elementary school, for secondary school, and somewhat to the other, the TVT and the, the, and the higher education. But at what expense? And everybody talks about how the quality of education in Ethiopia, I mean, basically what happened over the last 20, 27 years, there is the quality has suffered a great deal. And I'll try to explain what it means to have that kind of um, reduction. I mean, uh, the quality of, of uh, especially when you compare it to Addis Ababa University and Alemaya and, and, and the present universities. There is also another phenomena which is borrowed from mainly Far East countries that higher education should emphasize natural sciences over social sciences. Therefore, there is like this dichotomy where the undergraduate population will be 70% uh, natural sciences and 30% and social sciences. Interestingly, there are more engineer graduate in Ethiopia or unemployed than sociologists. That we can talk about why that happened. I think one of the problem of, 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 of the expansion is there was not real attempt to link it to the economy in terms of graduates coming out of colleges and universities, there was no attempt or there's no link to, to, to the niche, to, 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 to job creation, even though there is all the, 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 the discussion on that. But therefore there's a poor quality education at all levels. I, I would like to, you know, there were, uh, Adam mentioned to me the other day, in, um, pay, I paid attention to a, a report written by the UK Department of International Development on uh, basically uh, the title of the, the, their, their working paper was Assessing Needs of the Research System in Ethiopia. It was published in October 2019. It was desk-based research. It has some informa, inform, uh, informa, informal interview, and it looked at research environment, political economy, research production, and research diffusion. What they stated from the beginning is that they don't want to look at history. Instead, they want to look at statically at one period, those, those period. But that's a very unfortunate. It reminds me of when I was a graduate student, there was a famous a uh, famine study which went to Debra Tabor and came out saying how sad it is Debra Tabor, nobody is eating any meat. The person was flown into Addis Ababa then to Gondar. And what was interesting about it is that there was a fasting period of Ethiopian, like this is the time before Christmas. For so there was this observation that people are not eating. Therefore what happened was there is this dichotomy of not understanding the culture, understanding the history, and there is this mis, you know, misplacement of analysis. Or this the report sounds like one of those World Bank uh, reports about the economy of developing countries, in particular Ethiopia. If we look at all the variables, 
Ethiopians should not be walking on the street because they should be dead in terms of the, stat the way statistics are done. For what I'm trying to say is without proper understanding of history, we won't be able to understand Ethiopia, Ethiopians' higher education. And what I'll try to do today is actually counteract that and what do we should look at that. The other mentioned by the, 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 by the UK Department of International Development was that up to 1918, Ethiopia was basically an authoritarian regime, which I agree broadly, but we don't know what it means, what one is looking for. So what I want to do is to look at history of Ethiopian higher ed question by giving concrete example. I would like to start with the number of high schools. There was about maybe 10 high schools when I grew up in the 1960s, which were important, 1915, 16. So one was Kotebe High School, which educated a large number of students from both Addis Ababa and from the rural areas. Initially it was a high school, mainly uh, the teaching staff were foreigners, Indians and other, other nationalities, which uh, the Ethiopian government brought in. Then when later on, almost toward the end of Haile Selassie regime, Kotebe became a teacher's college, basically to train the next generation of high school teachers, et cetera. Then when the Derg, uh, after the, and Derg continued with that, with EPR DEF, it became a metropolitan university. It's called Kotebe, Kotebe Metropolitan University. It was under control of, of Addis, Ababa, Addis Ababa City Council. And now about less than six months ago, it has become uh, Kotebe University of Education. What is lacking in this is that there is no attempt to build upon the past. There is a tendency by the three regimes I mentioned to completely forget that in order to build higher education, you need to build upon the past. If you look at the graduates of the high school of Kotebe, they were very prominent people in building up modern Ethiopia. That was ignored. It became a teacher college. Maybe that's a logical thing to be. Then it was pushed to, to, to become a metropolitan university. Terms are borrowed, ideas are borrowed without substantive understanding of what it entails. So what we have is you have, uh, let me give you an example, which I know most, for instance, if you look at University of Namibia, for instance, it was a teacher in question and they built upon it to make it University of Namibia. If you look at the University of Pretoria, it was an agriculture college and became a university, but kept the agriculture, uh, the agriculture um, section. Now it's considered number one in Africa, number 42 or three in the world as an institution. So what is lacking in Ethiopia is we don't have any kind of memory. We don't have any kind of things. Every government which comes, we put in without substantive understanding and impose rules, which actually undermines the whole notion of, of the university. Therefore, Kotebe is a good example. Let's look at the other university I worked uh, under, Wello University. I was there in the early 60s, as a young, uh, my father was based there. The most important school in that, in that province was Wezerosihin School, high school. By far, it educated a whole generation of new leaders of Ethiopia, including Isaias from, from Ertera. So that was just made a technical college and Wello University was built a bit further out of, outside of the city without any kind of transition, without any kind of uh, link. I don't understand what's the logic of it. There is a tendency of an Ethiopian higher education to start always from zero. Uh, and that, that, that shows, and the logical thing should have been, uh, the logical thing should have been that to build upon whether it's in school, and make it a college, then a university. Instead, the APRDF government built 
36 universities, 38 universities. What are those 38 universities? They are under one formula, one architect, one system of libraries, for instance. I'll come up to the library because it's important. For that regime, what is important is to build a library, but brick and mortars, not the books. And I'll come back. I'll, I'll, let me talk about that in more detail. If you go to any of the universities, with the exception of maybe four or five or six universities in Ethiopia, the libraries are basically empty or donated books from voluntarily. Is it a lack of budget? Far from it. It has a huge budget. What do they do when I talk about revolutionary democracy? Here it becomes. Higher education is seen as a tool basically to accumulate a little bit wealth, whoever is in power. So what happened, the library, you know, the, we can, you know, the university is not able to go and purchase books on its own or what is needed. What they do is they're supposed to go to Addis and buy it from certain schools. I mean, certain stores, certain bookstores. And those bookstores are not available, mainly supplied by like if you starting, I remember being asked at uh, some of the universities, they want to start an Ethiopian studies. And most of the books which were purchased were Indian owned and has very little work on Ethiopia. So they go and buy books every year. They go like a store, they go to market. They'll get on the big truck and go there, purchase things from selected, uh, selected um, stores. And then you go there, hardly anybody uses the library because it has no connection. Can one imagine a university without a proper li library? And that's what we're facing in Ethiopia, with the exception of maybe eight universities, Addis Ababa, Alamea, Makale, Bardar, maybe, um, and, and few more. Most of them are empty shells. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the for why is that? Because there is this link of doing certain things which has nothing to do with the university, which has nothing to do with the library, but with a way of, you know, certain people acquire, you know, this is what happened up to 2018, where people are sent, are sent to 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 Addis Ababa to purchase books which are useless. So what was the solution which was uh, which was um, which was uh, suggested? I mean, again, I'm, I, I, as, as, as Adam mentioned it, my experience, when I saw this, I suggested the best thing to do would be to pull together all the resources of 38, 38 universities libraries and pull together one budget and begin to negotiate with international publishers. Simple thing to do so that we don't have to you know, we can actually buy relevant books which are relevant to Ethiopian reality. And I remember sitting down in Addis Ababa University libraries, asking them, look, you know, we can offer you this kind of possibilities. And they will tell us there's no budget. And the budget is, ta is, 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 is basically used for its own purpose. Therefore, what happens is here you have 38 universities without proper library, uh, with, without, without, uh, any useful uh, libraries. And let me now go on in terms of, I'm, I'm aware of time, I only have 10 minutes. Uh, when I was working at Wello University, I was asked to nominate people to go to, for, for uh, to, nom to, to compete for scholarship. And we succeeded in having four individuals to uh, to go to South Africa to study in political science, in law, in economics, in history. All these the four individuals were not from Addis Ababa. They were educated in state schools. And all of them went there. Four, three of them finished within three years. And one is just submitted his, 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 his uh, economics uh, thing. The same thing in Waldia. We managed to organize again, to send people to, to, to South Africa, something like 20 students in every field, University of Cape Town, University of Pretoria, and University of Western Cape. To University of Cape Town, we send science students. 
for University of Pretoria, we send agriculture students and University of Wisconsin combination of things, but mainly social science and psychology. If we look at the report I mentioned to you, it would have been unthinkable for these individuals to go to what I call most of these universities in South Africa, which are equivalent of an average European university, British university. They go there and compete and they finish within three years in almost all disciplines. How does that happen? Why that we succeeded in sending 25 students to about, to about four or five universities. All of them have finished. All of them have published with the, in terms of at, a, at an international accredited journals. So what is missing? What is it that now, why, why we're not producing within Ethiopia high quality, the question, high quality uh, scholarly paper, high, high quality uh, knowledge production? And the answer is basically, to me, what I saw since the early 20, uh, for the last 14, 15 years is that higher education high, is highly politicized and people who are with abilities are not given the chances. So what is needed? Uh, then we need to see what are the structural problems which are kind of inhibiting people from not performing. First of all, I think many people, I mean, there is this notion in Ethiopia when you go to Addis, almost everybody, every middle-class person then their kids to private schools now with the hope that they don't go to an Ethiopian university, they go abroad. I mean, that's what you see. That's not true if you are in the, in the provincial town, whether you are in Debrabrahan or in Bahardar or in Awasa. What happens is now there is this notion that what is good is only private, private schools. When I grew up, actually, the best schools were state schools. So what went wrong? What is wrong? What's going on? So first of all, we don't have proper teacher, tra tra teacher training colleges. I think that's where the weakness of Ethiopian system now is. We don't have proper teaching things so that if we have a proper teaching uh, training colleges, high schools and elementaries will get a better deal. And this is, this is what we saw in the 1960s. We don't have proper libraries. And I mean it, I gave you the example. The salary at, at, uh, at uh, Ethiopian University is something like 8,500 bir a month. That's not a living wage. So we need to increase the salary by at least three fourths of all the teaching staff at all levels from elementary up to, up to that. Fourth, we need to make universities relevant to the local economy and the local conditions. At, at, at uh, like the Ethiopian constitution in the, in the 1980s, I mean, in the, during the dark period and in, during the, the PRDF period, we might have, when you look at the university constitution, when you look at the university's mission statement, etc. I mean, it just, they are borrowed from other universities look perfect. When you look at them, they are not at all uh, relevant. Let's go to the library, for instance. I haven't seen, with the exception of Deborah Marcos University, I haven't seen any archives being built in those libraries. I'm not talking about archives in the sense of what's uh, available in Addis, but archives which are relevant to the local community, archives which are which are important to keep and the university should do that. At the moment, I, th I don't know how many of, of you uh, have, have followed Ethiopian politics. The, uh, the first time there is a possible strike coming out. 40,000 uh, university teacher associations say they are calling for strike. And they are asking first for the salary to go up. They have tax-free houses rented, we, uh, ta uh, tax-free house rentals, a research fund for PhD students, and overtime payment. I mean, that can be negotiated. But the point I'm making is I'm completely agreeing with what they are asking if we want to improve 
improve that. The other sad situation in Ethiopia is we are allowing markets, you know, we have this notion as to the market is going to solve the problem. For there are this, with the exception of maybe four private universities, there are so many universities who are handing out degrees now for, you know, and which is at the end of the day is going to create huge amount of problem, both for the economy and for, for, for also competition for the state universities. For what I'm trying to suggest here, and I'm coming to my end talk, it's about 26 minutes, Adam, is that we need to rethink higher education in Ethiopia. And first of all, to think locally, to think how we can improve, how can we link the, the curriculum to the local economy? Second, the notion of, you know, to make the notion of teaching or to, to, as, as, a, as a vocation to be respected. And that will be, therefore, what I'm trying to say is there is a way of solving Ethiopians' problem locally without going too far. And I'll stop there and maybe we would, would have the discussion from there too. Thank Are you. you uh, uh, yes, thank you, Abba, for your presentation. I would like to ask everybody to start putting your questions in the chat, and I will ask for your name to um, ask Abba himself directly with your voice. But um, in the meanwhile, Abba, I can uh, ask you uh, a question related to your presentation. And thank you that for emphasizing that, like some of these questions that we are talking about um, in terms of the political economy of knowledge production, has to do with the very foundation of like uh, how universities are established in Ethiopia and like the history is relevant um, and how we conversate about these questions. Um, for me, I want to specifically ask you about um, the issue of equitability, which is, um, let's say, for example, Ethiopia is one of the countries who follow a federal structure and increasingly education is seen as a way of making sure regions, different regions have equitable access to uh, be it uh, as part of higher education as well. So for federal governments to make sure that it's equitable for everybody, um, it, they need to, like there is a demand for many regions asking their own institutions or their own higher educations to be set up. And I wanted to ask you, what's the implication of this, especially in regards to knowledge productions, or especially if you can speak about the experience of researchers in these universities, um, how can we especially compensate or how can we make sure that as we expand these universities that the qualities of these researchers' experiences is not compromised? Okay. Uh, there's nothing, you know, there's, I think there's nothing wrong with different groups, different uh, states, you know, different I mean, there's a debate about whether we should have a ethnic federalism, but that's an, another debate. But what my emphasis would be, can we make the different, like, I mean, let me give you a specific example. If we look at Deborah Brahan University, it's about two hours from Addis Ababa. It's, uh, it has a number of interesting possibilities of developing its own speciality and one of it is what is called in Europe medieval studies it's the only the only African country which has actually a vibrant medieval studies I wouldn't it's a golden age of Ethiopian 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 history they could develop that not only for De Deborah Abraham but for the for, 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 for the nation as a whole if you go to other places, I mean, therefore, as long as decentralization means specialization by area, that's excellent. But if it means that we have to have this because Jima University had this, therefore we have to have the same thing in, say, Walega University, I think that's just what EPR Def has done for the last 30 years. Therefore, there's the replication of the same thing again and again. But what is needed is, a specific development. For instance, if you go to Bali, Wadawa Malawa University, it has 
this valley mountains, which is the kind of the resources of water, not only for the, that area, but the whole region up to Somali, there's very little done. There is, you know, the, about by the local by the local university on that area. What happens is Oxford University, for instance, has a, a program of looking at the Abyssinian uh, Fox program with no link to the local to the local university. For what is needed is yes, the, the demand for specialties is important. The demand for developing specific area studies is very good. But it has to be done not for the sake of political equity in that sort of, but making you know specializing will be important. Most of the excuses, most of the time, is we don't have a budget. By Ethiopian standard, there's a huge amount of money. Most of the university's budget is about um, uh, almost close to a billion per a year. That's a huge amount of money in the context of Ethiopia. But how is it being used? That's what I was talking about. Proper decentralization, that's very, you know, very important without the politics of ethnicity. If we do that, I think we'll be able to succeed that because almost if you go to Deborah Marcos, for instance, they're trying to develop as a center of excellence for literature because there is a huge history of that. If you go to Wello University, you know, excellent on music, etc. One can develop that without end, can develop, you know, what is sad about, there is so much work done on Ethiopia now, a published work, and Ethiopians are either as the footnotes or they are just tanked. They basically help outsiders to come do the research. I'm not trying to say outsiders should not come and do the research, but Ethiopians should produce. I mean, this there is this notion, you know, we, uh, the problem is there are all these rules which would be imposed by the federal government, by the Department of Education, for instance, saying each, uh, every PhD student should publish two articles in internationally accredited journals, which is very good. but. I don't know one journal in Ethiopia which has reached that level. For your, you know, it's like you know, it's like asking somebody to do something, but the situation is impossible. So what does happen now? Each individual lecturer I know, each individual um, uh, PhD student, develop his own or her own library because the libraries most of the time are uh, useless to 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 compete internationally. The reason I gave that example of 24 people going to universities in, 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 um, in South Africa was to show that if Ethiopians are given the chances they can compete globally, but the conditions are not there yet. I'm not sure whether I answer your question, Adam. Sure, sure. No, no thank you very much. Um, now I will actually uh, proceed to uh, some of the questions that are being raised in the chat. And I will ask each of you to, as I call for your name, to unmute and ask uh, Ababa directly. Uh, can I have Leah Muligeta first? And then uh, I will have Tolera Simi um, next. But for now, I'll have, I will start with Leah Muligeta, please. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Zagai. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how Ethiopia has leaned into Western knowledge production rather than indigenous knowledge production. Can you please speak up more about your opinion on this topic, such as what indigenous knowledge production would entail? Uh, thank you for this question. I think there is this, to me, uh, there is this kind of mystification of indigenous knowledge. Let me give you an example. One example from my experience in Southern Africa, in particular in Zimbabwe. There's been a demand to teach Mbira, the one you play with your finger in schools. And Mbira is not taught in uh, Western universities. It's only practiced by rural people in Zimbabwe. Therefore, there's this guy called Albert who's been pushing this. Finally, the, the Zimbabwean parliament approved to have Mbira taught at, at, at elementary school. He was not going against the teaching of piano or violin, etc. But he was asking for an African indigenous uh, indigenous um, music to be played. 
So what he has to do, he has to do first, the first thing he has to do is write a curriculum. He has to write it in, in music. That's the first thing he has to do. Second, he has to train. He has to train 700 teachers. So he created actually 700. You know, these people are not, don't have, these are traditional people. For so he brought them in. For so we have this notion as to knowledge means it has to come out of certain kind of condition. Knowledge is basically a human activity. Therefore, that human activity has to be systematically put together so that it's meaningful to the local co community. So what you have now in Zimbabwe is, in, you know, you have in Biram being taught. What that entails is that to write the line, to write the music, to train the teachers, and to actually publish works which is what it entails. For we create a knowledge. Therefore, we should not worry about in terms of fulfilling the requirement of classical European uh, education, but rather, you know, how can we develop something which, which you know, the same thing would happen in biology, the same thing in terms of that. But the problem is we don't know yet how to do that. That's what I meant by indigenous. I mean, yes, there is a lot of discussion about decolonization of the curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. In Ethiopia, what does mean? What does it mean to have decolonization of the curriculum in Ethiopia? It means we have to indigenize it. We have to make the local people responsible and be productive. And more importantly, up to now, if you look at the curriculum, we are consumers of knowledge, not producers of knowledge. And we need to change that. I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, next, I will have uh, Tolera, and then I will also ask uh, to guide more of our conversation towards like the research aspects as well in terms of um, what the implication of these conversations and researchers and knowledge production and not just teaching. Uh, Tolera, can I have okay. ask the question? Um, thank you, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Ababa. Um, I just want to ask about um, um, the medium of instruction, English. Um, it is, uh, there is a saying in English, uh, there is an elephant in the room that everyone avoid talking about. Um, you've touched on um, almost, you know, all the barriers um, uh, in Ethiopian uh, higher education and in Ethiopian education in general. Uh, but I'm, I'm a researcher, I'm a PhD student based in UCL and I'm looking at the uh, experience of teachers and the students of learning academic subjects through the medium of uh, English in Ethiopian universities. And what I see uh, is that um, not just the students, the, st the teachers themselves have problem in using the language. And um, uh, there is no way we can, um, you know, we'll be in a position to produce knowledge through the medium of English, unless we have the command of the language. Um, it's, it is really um, a, sad, a sad story. And it's, this relates to a lived experience as well. I was you know, educated through uh, the same system. So um, I just wonder why many, there are only few Ethiopian scholars that um, you know, do not talk about the impact that English is having on the quality of education and knowledge production. And I just want to, you know, um, have uh, your, your take on that. Thank you. Thank you, Tolora. I think we need to be careful about, you know, to use only, you know, we should, <laughs> One of the big mistakes that South Africans made is to choose, what, seven or nine languages as national languages. By default, English has become the national language, okay? In Ethiopia, English is supposed to be taught to be used for medium of instruction from seventh grade on through university. But if you go sit down in a classroom in many places, most of the teaching is done in Amharic, okay? Is that a good thing or bad thing? It depends how you see it. 
I think Amharic is highly developed language. It can be used. I mean, uh, Africa Only Press has produced, Africa Red Sea Press has produced, at, to my knowledge, at least two textbooks on science, one in mathematics, another one in, I forgot, algebra in, in Amharic, to be used, I think, was going to be experimented in Gondar University. Therefore, my suggestion is basically the language has become extremely politicized in Ethiopia. And my notion of what, how language should be used, we need a national language and that is Amharic. One have all kinds of issues on it, but it's been there for 700 years. It's highly sophisticated language. It can be used for teaching at the university level and beyond in publication. We don't expect Chinese to write in English all the time. We don't expect even Europeans, Germans or French, to write in, in, in English all the time. They actually are hiring people to be editors so that they can translate it from German to English, et cetera. Therefore, we need to be practical about it at one level, but at the same time, we need to develop our own languages. But what happens now in the Ethiopian politics is now they see, you know, it's like we don't recognize the, the value of what has been achieved. They, you know, as, you know, therefore now we have an Ethiopia where there's a lot of debate on that. For English, in a way, what we have is the worst of balls. We don't, you know, you go to a classroom, mm -hmm. it's taught in Amharic. I mean, I was sitting in, in, in my office in Weldia and individuals would come to me, they can't speak English, they can't speak Amharic, they'll come and ask me in another language. Therefore, they have to, most of the time on, on Armenia, they'll come with the translator to, to my office. So I think we need to resolve it and we have to be practical about it. I think we need to develop Amharic and other languages. We need to encourage Ethiopians to be multilingual. For instance, the people who live between Gondar and Tigray should be speaking both Tigray and, 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 and Amarinya. I think we need to be more creative and not compromise politically. And that's the danger of it. Um, I will, uh, sorry to cut you off, Abebe, um, just so we can have more of the questions from the team. Sure, sure. Um, and certainly like the difficulty of language, um, especially uh, the politicization of it is relevant in the conversation that we have. Uh, but again, um, to go back more to the research aspects would be also useful so can i have uh, so i will be selecting questions especially in regards to because again um we can't go broad towards to the politics of these things so i would say let's more focus on the research can i have david mills like ask a question next because again thank you very much that was was brilliant and really um uh, you have really a holistic analysis of the situation and you're right to criticize that um report i have to admit that i was the one who who forwarded it to Adam. It, so the, the aim of it was not to do the history. The aim of it would be a rather brutal accounting of, of research systems. And, and it was comparing seven different African research systems. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, people can see it. And it was deliberately saying, right, well, this is not historical. This is not trying to understand the past. It's, it's a sort of an accounting of the present. But, but uh, my question really is about, um, it, it is about the future. And it, it is about how, how, how the system responds to these challenges you presented us. It seems as if, and I'm not saying that it has to be teaching versus research, but but, you, but would it be fair to say that, that chasing the international, chasing a sort, of, a, a, a sort of productivist notion of research, which is based on international publications, it, it, it should not be the priority, that actually the priority in the first instance should be about building what you describe as relevant universities that, that can redefine what counts as scholarship um and 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 or, or is that not a helpful division between teaching and research at all i think we can do both i mean in my life time for instance the best people in medicine came out ethiopians who came out of first other church uh, out of the church school and then university of edinburgh the second person that's medicine in history the best came person came we still use the church and state uh, Tamra, uh, he went to school when first grade in, when he was 14. 
Then later on, he went to saw us, did this book. For I think we can do both. I think we need to be more creative about it because it's not, it's actually simpler now than before because of technology. I think what places like Oxford could do is what, I mean, I'll be very specific, what Paul Collier, um, I should say, sir, sir, he's, he's knighted now, did in the 19... 90s and 1980s, where he saw a gap of quality of research and data on economics. So what did he do? He basically started a program between Addis Ababa University and Oxford University to teach MA courses and to gather information. And he, brought, he produced excellent, excellent graduate students. For I think we need to do that kind of intervention. And the reason I gave that uh, example of Waldia and Wello is that people in Ethiopia, if given chances, they can perform equally with any international thing. Therefore, we can do both. And the other thing I think people should know about the quality of research is almost all the teachers of Ethiopia now in the Ethiopian universities are a product of about five universities within Ethiopia. So they are almost equal in terms of what they know and how they go about it. You know, the Addis Ababa, Bahardar, Makali, etc. For I think there is a need to intervene, but the intervene has to be creative. Uh, the you know, these days, for instance, we need to develop the libraries in a good way. We need to cooperate with international libraries through digital forms, etc. I don't want to go into that politics, but I think we can do that. For my answer is, we can do both. We can do both and we can be successful. And that's my experience of, you know, I was, I helped to set up the UNISA campus in Addis. We are quote unquote Pan-Africanist and we did it for all kinds of reasons. But actually we, there are, you know, there is a guy I know called Dr. Girma who did PhD in, in English literature, who teaches at Debra Marcos University who got his degree from UNISA. And one could do that. Then the other thing which is missing in Ethiopia, which nobody talks about is, there are about 200 veterinary doctors who practice in Ethiopia now. And all of them were trained either in Cuba or Eastern Europe. We tend to, uh, to look down upon that. I think that's a big mistake. I think for what we need to do is how do we develop local, uh, very localized uh, kind of research topics, but at the same time, internationalize it. Um, thank you, Abubai. Uh, next, I will have uh, Eyob Balcha uh, to ask, and thank you, Eyob, for forwarding some of like the links and resources. Actually, thank you, Adam Sengat, for the opportunity. I thank the organizers and the presenter, Professor Abel, for the useful session. I have one quick comment and a question. The quick comment is, I think, the way that we keep on referring uh, indigenous knowledge, every knowledge um, in Africa or in Ethiopia or in other parts of the world that has indigenous knowledge, I think it's quite problematic because we assume that there is a, a universal knowledge. That's the, the, the implication that I'm stated inside them. For me, every knowledge is indigenous to a particular society based on its social historical processes. So that kind of hierarchization of knowledge is, I think, one of the epistemological challenges that we have, which is also reflected broadly in the higher education system. So that's something that I would strongly uh, challenge. Uh, but my question to the to Professor Abbebe is, you refer, at, I've also seen it on the abstract that you refer to revolutionary democracy as part of the problem. And I think uh, it is right to criticize it and also to challenge the intentions and the insights that uh, EPR the fullest used in that regard. However, by also using your own logic, without, just to avoid throwing the baby along with the bath water, what are the positives that we can take from the revolutionary democracy ideology and its relation to the education system? And what are the negatives? I think it's important to identify that even some of the access related or expansion related issues or the role of the state in shaping some kinds of dynamics within the social, socioeconomic progress context can be considered or attributed to revolutionary democracy 
with all its limitations. So I wonder if you can comment on that. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I used revolutionary democracy in a polemic way, but if you want to understand, if you want to see what I think about it, I've just published two articles. One is in, I'll send it to Adam, uh, in Journal of Developing Society. And uh, I, I actually, you know, look at the different uh, uh, aspect of it. What I was trying to, you know, and then the same thing about, there's another paper in Amharic, which has come out in uh, a journal called JAL, which comes out of New Jersey in Princeton. I'll make it available for you to look in terms of what I think of revolutionary democracy. I agree with your notion of uh, indigenous knowledge. I'm a trained sociologist, scientific uh, revolution. I read Kuhn when I was undergraduate and that's the way I think. Knowledge is universal and we just have my argument now about indigenous knowledge and it's been argued is that we need, you know, I don't know how to explain some of the best work which came out of Ethiopia or Eritrea for that matter. If you look at the Geda system, for instance, just to give you an example, Geda system, no Italian anthropologist couldn't figure it out, nor the social anthropologist of Oxford. It was Asmar of Legesse who went to Wallega and other places and figure out this, the age system. For, do we call that indigenous knowledge? No, it's a scientific knowledge. Therefore, I think I agree with you broadly and I've written about that. Therefore, I don't, what I'm trying to say is actually my point is we should become what happened in African societies and African universities is we are consumers of, of knowledge instead of pro, uh, producers. That's what my, my central argument is here. But I'll make the papers available. It's a long discussion about revolution. It's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yob. And um, can I have um, Ellen Hazelkron? Sorry for mispronouncing your name next. Hi, sorry, thank you very much. And you did very well um, on my name, thank you. Um, so I have a slightly related question. Thank you very much for your talk. And um, I had a rela question related to your comment about um, localized research topics. And that's largely where I was coming from is really the issue about graduate employment. Um, particularly looking at research graduate employment, seeing as this is the orientation of this seminar. But what is the, um, can you talk to us about the issue of graduate employment? One of the issues that certainly um, is a big topic across Europe and other countries is, is underemployment. Um, or, and so I'm also interested in whether or not the types of research topics that reach, um, and the other big issue, if I could say, is about societal impact of research. So I'm interested in the extent to which um, relevant societal impact, engagement with um, business or, or civil society are big factors in choosing research topics. And if you could say something about um, that doctoral experience. Thank you. Okay. I will. At this moment, Ethiopia needs as much as graduates as possible if we're going to have a viable economy. Why, why we decided to say, you know, one, let me give you one example. Uh, in as, you know, many people thought I was completely mad to send people to University of Cape Town to study astronomy and mathematics, theoretical mathematics and astronomy. My argument was a simple one. There are four places in the world where astronomy, I mean, where you have the best site for astronomy. It is South Africa, Australia, Chile, and Lalibela in Northern Ethiopia. And whether we like it or not, Ethiopia, as I mentioned, we need to be involved so that we can develop, you know, the whole notion was what would happen in that, you know, there was interest by EPRDF in, in terms of uh, developing and ast astronomy interest in all kinds of issues in terms of what the future holds. And my argument was, if we don't develop our own astronomers, our own theoretical mathematicians, we'll be left behind. 
in terms of knowledge production, in terms of knowledge economy. Therefore, my argument is basically less train people, less create a mathematical institute. You know, the best example is what's been done in Cape Town, as well, by the way, in terms of mathematical institute, where mathematics is the foundation of modern economy. So we need to develop where it leads us, I'm not sure. But to be left alone is asking for a problem. So therefore, in Ethiopia, the problem is not really the fit, but is the quality is so low. And the people who are, you know, let me give you another example. We have one of the, you know, in terms of agriculture, we don't have enough veterinary people. I mean, there are people in, in Ethiopia to, to deal with that. So what do you, if you ask me, we should develop a very strong veterinary sciences. Do we send these people to the West, say to the veterinary school in Philadelphia? There's only one in the whole of state of Pennsylvania, the most expensive, more expensive than, 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 than sending uh, to medical school. You know, those are the issues we need to deal with. Therefore, well, that's why I mentioned earlier on that actually the people who are sent to Eastern Europe and Cuba are doing an incredible job. The, you see them in all rural part of Ethiopia, working with with the farmers, etc. Therefore, we need. I think there is a need for the Department of Education to begin to think how are we going to train people locally so that they are relevant to the economy. What we have is basically there are more PhD people in New Jersey than there is in the whole of the Ethiopia now, PhD in sciences, not even social sciences. So what I'm, my, my interest is, let's develop locally relevant to the economies. Of course, we've seen some of the kind of the borrowing of, of some of the ideas from, from Taiwan and other places during EPRDF. That has not been that successful. And there is a debate to that. There is that new book which, uh, which came out about the, you know, the Oxford University brought out that book to show what, you know, where are we moving? Are we relevant in the economy? Those debates are there. But what my saying is that I'm not too much worried about it as long as the quality of the graduates are good enough, they'll find their way. And I'm completely impressed by the, you know, the young people who went to Cuba and who came back who are serving as, as, as medical doctors, as veterinary and others. Therefore, I think in Ethiopia case, it's not the kind of problem what you have in other parts of the world where, where um, there's, you know, there's no compatibility what's being produced and what, is, what the economy needs. I'm not sure whether I answer your question broader. Um, thank you, uh, Abebe, and thank you, everybody, for the sake of time. I think we, I would uh, end the questions here. Uh, but I appreciate everyone for joining us and we have our next webinar uh, on uh, Nigeria. Please do uh, join us for the next uh, webinar as well and you can sign up for these webinars on uh, the website for Center for Global Higher Education. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.